Okay, so we're going to build a Redis clone, and Redis is a NoSQL database, and so I'm going to call it my-redis, and then in there... Hey, can I have yeah. a question? Just yeah. Just real quick, because there's this confusion for me. When we open up the two windows, Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. One represents the server and one represents the client? Yeah. Right. Yep. Can you help me to identify which is the client and which is the server? It's just so unclear on this. I, I have an idea, but I want to be sure. Uh, so when you open up the one and it's sitting there, that's the server waiting for input, correct? Yeah. Okay. And then the one where I you initiate command and get feedback is imitating mimicking the client. Yeah. Okay, got it. So server and client are things that we invent. Right. right. So that's why naming is important, because the program itself is whatever it does. So you can call the program server and use it as a client. That would be confusing, but you right. can do that. The computer doesn't care. And so that's why it's important to name things. Okay. Thank you. So I make this main.go, and we're going to start a listener. Uh, TCP, and we're going to listen on port 1000. Um, and we're just going to fatally die if it can't find the port or whatever. We'll defer and close. And then in a loop, we'll accept a connection. Same idea. And then what I'm going to do is create a function. So remember, functions are one of your tools for making code easier to understand. Uh, I know I'm going to have a bunch of code for my connection, so I'm just going to make a handle function. It'll take in the connection and handle it, okay? And so in here, I'm just going to say uh, handle con, okay? So this keeps my listener loop really simple and my connection handling loop up here. The other nice thing that gives us the ability to do is say, Defer a conduct close. And so that's like the first thing I do is I'm going to eventually close this connection. But for now, since, uh, since the sort of Redis protocol is like get and then the key, and we'll do it line by line, we can use a scanner. So scanner equal buff out undo scanner, give it con, and then we'll loop over that. So this is getting one command at a time, basically. So we got a single line of text, right? So at this point, let's just print that out and see what we get. Okay, so I will go to here and where am I? Two, red is Okay, go install, and then I called it my-redis. So now it's running. I'm going to open another window and tell it into it. Uh, port 9000. I'm going to type get space. Okay, so whenever I type, it's going to be printing it out now. So if I type a bunch of garbage, we'll see the garbage show up, okay? Because that's all I'm doing here is reading the line. So that's as I expected. So this line is each line of the command the user enters. So now the idea is that I want to interpret that line. I want to parse that line as text. There's a lot of ways we could do this. I'm just going to do this with fields. So you can say strings.fields line, okay? And then let's say if the length of fields is, um, I actually don't think this can happen. Well, yeah, if it was just the empty string, maybe it could. So if, it, if it's uh, equal to zero, if, there's, if the length is, you know, I didn't get any fields, we'll just continue. We'll skip that line. So in other words, we're skipping blank lines here. So maybe I'll put a comment for that. And then we're going to switch on the first thing, okay? So there are three cases, right? There's get, there's set, there's delete, and then there's like default. So for default, maybe what we'll do is um, we'll, we'll send to the, connection, uh, to the connection, you know, invalid command. But for the others, we're going to do something, right? So let's see if this works, this version of the program. 
strings that feel to church the line, the word? It splits up a, a string by spaces. So if there's like okay. 10 spaces, it collapses them. Okay. Um, otherwise, you'd end up with a whole bunch of blank. Uh, and scanner just scans line by line, and so you don't have to use scan line. Uh, remember, you can choose how it wants to scan by setting the split function. Uh, so, I enter test invalid command. That's what I expect to see, right? Because test is invalid, so I'd say that. You know, if I do get, then nothing happens. The reason nothing happens is because I haven't implemented anything here. Um, remember, they don't fall through, so it doesn't go to here. Incidentally, we saw that maybe I should add a new line here. Because, uh, Put the cursor here. I probably won't put it here. But that's the basic idea. Now, what's a good data structure for this this kind of thing? What should we use to store our data? A map. A map. Sounds exactly right, huh? So we actually need to make this. I'm just going to make it string string, okay? Uh, because we only have strings. Now, Lil Redis supports other data types, but we're just doing strings, okay? Uh, and so how do we get? We say v colon equal um, so the key is one actually there's a little extra code we need to write here. Same problem we had before. So maybe what I'm going to do is change this, because all of them take at least a key. So get key, set key, delete key. So I'm just changing it up there, so I don't have to write it here. Um, but now I have my key, and then I get the value. Uh, I'll type that out just so it's easier to read. And then I can send it back to the client, right? And so the idea is that I can use the same right string, or I could use fprint. Fprint is like print f. So I have f print f, print f but it prints to uh, a writer, like file print. That's what that means. Uh, so now I'm going to be printing to that using the format I say. So I'll say percent s slash n, and then hand it value. That's just a nice. If you had a lot of things you wanted to print, that might be a nice way to do it. But you could use dial write string. You could also use a con dot write and give it the conversion. A lot of ways to do that, but that's that's a pretty easy one. So let's see if that works. So I didn't get anything back, so I get a blank line and move the down one. The reason I didn't get anything back is there's nothing in there, right? So we need to implement set. Uh, so key is the same, right? Because you know maybe we put a comment here: get key, and this will be set key. Uh, value. So we get the key, and now we get the value. And so this is where we need to add that check. Uh, maybe we print out an error. You know, expected value, or whatever. You can come up with better errors for users. Um, and we just do continue to go back up to the loop. Uh, and then we'd set it. So we just say data at key equals value. And maybe we don't print anything, maybe we do. Up to us. I'm just not going to print anything. But run this, reconnect. I say set, uh, let's say key value. Oh, it's all caps. Okay, and then I say get key, and we get back value. So it's storing it in our in our map. So, and then to delete is pretty much the same thing. We get the key and we just say delete data key. Okay? So, I say set key value and then I say get key to get it and then I say delete key and then I say get key again and I get back nothing because I deleted it. So we have our basic Redis, no, no SQL key value store. Uh, we can get things, put them in there, and delete them. Uh, Copy that to scratch, please. Yeah. 
Um, there are several issues with this code. So let's walk through those issues because they'll illuminate us here. The first is, well, what, what are some issues with this code? So we saw this one yesterday, right? It only handles one connection at a time. So we might say, what if I just put go here? Now it can handle lots of connections. What's wrong with this code? Yeah, race condition. Race condition. Data here is this global variable. It's packaged local, but essentially global. Um, and there's possibly more than one go routine at a time modifying it, right? It'd be one thing to read it. You could read it all at the same time. That'd be OK. But because we're modifying it, right, the deleting or setting, that's a problem. Uh, and so this code will, it could crash. It could do weird stuff uh, if you try to run it. And so remember, there was two ways to address this. What was one of the ways? We could use Channel. channels. What was the other? Uh, mutex. And so we could put a mutex. And every time we access data, we lock, do stuff to data, unlock. And the same thing when we used to, we, when we got the value, we, we lock, get the value, unlock. And we can do that, okay? Uh, and that is certainly one way to address that problem, but instead I think we should use channels. Okay, so this is going to get a little more complex when we try to change this code to be which Version two, I got version one. Okay. And so what, the idea here is that I'm going to have my connections. They're going to come into issue commands. And so what I would like to do is make a process, a single go routine, that sort of handles all of that for us. It's sort of like our master process that uh, takes in commands, does stuff to the map, and sends them back out again. Okay? So the way we're going to do that, um, I'm going to call it, so I'm going to create a function. And it's going to be, let's, let's call it a Redis server. And it's going to take in a channel of strings. Actually, not strings. We've got to create a type for this. So we're going to call this a command. Um, and we'll call it, I don't know, fields is a slice of string. That'll be the same thing here. That's essentially what this is going to be. And then we're going to have a result, chan string. And the result here is the result of whatever the server is going to do. So if the server does something, it, it'll process the fields thing, and then it'll send optionally, we'll either send like an empty line, but or we'll send, if I can get, I'll send the value over that result channel. Okay. So this changes to a chain of command. And what he does is for each command, going to be to, uh, so we basically have to take the logic from down here. So this is the first thing I have to do. Um, so instead of continuing, I need to send, first I need to send on the result. probably actually want to do this. I, I could do it, but then I'm waiting, and I could be potentially waiting on a slow listener, right, if I do it the other way. But this way, I make it so that I don't have to wait. The other way we could do that is with a buffer channel. Um, but I'll do it this way first, and I'll show you the other way. Uh, and then we'll continue. We'll go back to the loop and handle the next command. So switch the command field zero, and then we'll put our cases here. So our get, set, and delete, they'll come up here. Um, right, so this becomes kind of fields one, and this becomes field. Instead of doing IO write string here, we have to do the same thing. Oops, sorry. So we pass in this error instead. But otherwise, we do the same exact logic. We, we 
go back to the loop, and then we handle these two. We do the same manipulation, except now we can move data up here. Um, so there's our set, and then our delete. This guy from here. All right. Um, okay, so for this, we need to do the same thing, except we use sprint f instead of f print f. So we don't need con, because we're not going to have con here. And then, uh, I guess we don't actually need a new one. Um, so actually, we don't even need that. We just say value. Okay. So now we're making progress. So now, what we're going to do, instead of uh, all of this code, which we just copied and put up there, what we're going to do is create a channel. And then what we're going to do is pass to, so we're going to change handle here so that it takes in our, our Redis server channel. So we'll call this the commands. Commands is a chan of command. And then the connection. And what we're going to do is pass into commands here. It'll take in a command. The fields is Fs and the result is result. Okay, so now what we're going to do is is we're sort of, we have this one channel and he's just reading the commands from the user and he sends them to our master Redis server channel. And that guy, he's gonna process the commands, but he does so in a way that doesn't uh, involve a race condition uh, because he only does one command at a time. So he does the commands and then he sends a result back. But since he does the result in a go routine, he doesn't wait on this to happen. He just moves on to the next command. But all the manipulation of the data is happening in one single place. There's no, there's no two writers. Okay? There's only one possible writer. Only this go routine is modifying the data and reading the data. Okay. What's the best then dash Put it on the channel. Yeah, that's the, yeah. Or take it off the channel. Right, and so range here is reading from the channel, and this is putting on the channel. So let me see if I probably made a mistake here. Um, okay, so here what we have to do is create our channel. So commands make channel of a command. And then we'll say go Redis server. So we'll start our master Redis server got, uh, go routine. And then we'll pass this in here. Okay, so now we have our Redis server running and now we're gonna start off a new go routine for every connection. And they'll communicate via channels to each other, okay? So let's see if this works. Set key value, get key. Ah, I forgot to finish this. What's wrong with this code? Daniel? Stack overflow? No, it's not a stack overflow. <laughs> so I created a result channel, but I never did anything with it. So I'm not getting the result back. Yeah, so F print. Yeah, it's print line. I don't know if that actually exists, but we'll see. Uh, and then we have to pull off of the result chain, right? What's the F print stand for? Format print? It's print line to the file. And so the file is the connection. Uh, okay. So it's just printing file. the result of this to that. And then the F on our side is formatting. So this is basically identical to io.writeString plus slash in. Okay, same and exact thing. Um, so so I, I, was, I forgot to pull this out. So it never sent anything back to the client. So that should fix that problem. Because if you look here, I didn't get anything when I said get key. Um, so let me try that again. 
So it's set key value, get key. <coughs> it didn't work. Is there something else I'm forgetting? Probably. Let's add some debugging. So let's see if we get our command. Cool, we got a command. So we see that up there. So that part's working. So something's, something's hold, held up here. <coughs> oh, uh, I don't return anything on set. That's the problem. So it was trying to pull off a result, but never got sent one, so it just sat there forever. OK, so the result I'm just going to put as an empty string. And we got to do the same for delete. Oops. OK. Let's try that. There, now, now it returns a, a blank. There we go. And now I get my value back, and then delete key, get key. Okay. But now our, our uh, code is, uh, we don't have that race condition anymore. And so this, this model of having this sort of master uh, loop doing all the commands, that's pretty typical. So the, the only little bit here is, like I said, we could get rid of these go routines right here. But if we did that, then we might be held up by a slow connection. Uh, because he'd be waiting for the other guy to read it. So, uh, but maybe it doesn't matter, actually. Now that I think about it. Um, I don't think it actually matters that much. So we can just make these directly without the go. So that's probably easier to read. OK. So now we just write directly to it without the, the go. I think it's still. Scratch that over. Make sure it works. The reason I say it actually doesn't matter is that we pull it off and then write it to the connection. So if it gets locked up waiting for the connection if it's really slow or something, this go routine is going to get slowed down, but not the one that the Redis server. So that Redis server can move on to the next command the other way. So a slow connection will not cause our whole server to wait for that connection. Okay? Our server will keep on doing its thing. Everybody following? So now we're dealing with our map in one place. We only manipulate it in one place. Okay? Uh, and so this is safe code and it's also very efficient because our, our, our handling of the connection is separate from the part about handling the database. So, Any questions about this? What's that pattern called? Does it have a name? I don't um, know. Halo optimized. It is very common go go. This is not an unusual approach to this problem. It's very typical. Um, so another approach is is you can sort of move these into a select statement and do it that way too. Um, but in our case, this works this works well. So you create a struct, you give it the data, and then you give it the result as a channel. And then you, when you're done doing whatever you're doing, you write to the result channel. The result. So now we have a Redis server. Uh, so I think we're going to do some more TCP servers because I think there's there's useful there's utility here in in the uh, learning about this process. Uh, these other two are modify echo so that it returns messages as rot13. Rot13 is like a 
it's encryption, but it's a joke of an encryption. Uh, so you can look up ROT13. Rotate by 13 places uh, is a simple letter substitution cipher. So basically it turns A into N and B into O and C into P. It moves it 13 places in the alphabet. Um, and so we want to make a program that does echo, but does it by doing this. Um, but I think before we do that, I wanted to mention about Redis. Some people were asking about this. So, uh, you know, Redis is a NoSQL database. You can find stuff at Redis.io. Um, and those are my group of keys here. Yeah, it doesn't that look familiar? So it's DEL. There's a bunch more. I mean, it obviously supports way more than we were doing, but I just wanted to show you that it, we're not too far off from what um, what it's actually doing. So we're not too far off from creating our own NoSQL yeah. database startup. That's right. Said. Uh, but I wanted to mention that you know some of the people are asking you know well why would you use Redis? What do people use it for? Uh, so Redis is very commonly used. It is a thing you will find in the in the real world. Uh, software companies use Redis. Um, and like I said, it's a NoSQL database. So. What that means is that we can do the, we can use it as key value store. We can store data in it by key and retrieve that data by key and delete things by key, along with some other operations, uh, you know, it supports lists and things. But it doesn't have the relationships that SQL gives you. So in SQL, you can define the relationships between rows and tables. I can say that, you know, this user has these transactions. And so that those transactions are associated with a specific user. Those relationships don't exist in Redis want them, you have to put them in there. And so it's a completely different model for how you do build data for a website. How um, old is this? Redis? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, it's a good question. It's not that old. Uh, when was its first? Caveman used Redis. Caveman. Say that again? Caveman. Oh, did you? I think it's less than 10 years old, I mean. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, just, just a couple things. Uh, to sort of get your mind away around the way web developers kind of think about these things. Um, Redis stores everything in memory. We just saw that. It basically stores everything in a giant map. So what are the downsides of that? You need a lot of memory. You need a lot of memory. And if you restart your computer, all your data is gone. That might be a problem for your database, right? In other words, if your computer crashes, you've just lost all of your data. Um, so the question is, how do web developers deal with that problem? How do they work around those issues? So let's deal with the memory one first, running out of memory. So let's say you don't have enough space. How do you deal with that problem? Anybody have an idea of what you might do? You run out of memory? Yeah, if you have, more, you have more data than you can store on your computer. Oh, well. So that's one approach. And SQL, in general, SQL servers, they will use a hard drive. But one of the downsides of that is Redis is really designed to be in memory for the performance. And the reason why you're using Redis is because it's fast. And the hard drive doesn't give you the performance that you want. And so uh, that's usually not something that's an option. Now, some people will do that. But generally, if you're going to use Redis, you don't want to put anything on the disk. Okay. But, so, but if in that same line of thinking, uh, we can get a computer with more memory. right? And I mean, that sounds like a joke. But the truth is, you can. You can get a computer with 64 gigs of RAM. Uh, it's going to be more expensive, but you can do it. I'm going to call that vertical scaling. So this whole, this whole problem we're thinking about is scaling. It's making it so my computers can do more. Right? I'm thinking about my application. It needs to handle more traffic. It needs to store more data. It's scaling. So that's vertical scaling. That's uh, make a bigger computer. Uh, that'll get you somewhere. That, that may be enough. Um, you know, you have your, currently you have an 8 gig of RAM machine, and you bump it up to 16. You've doubled your capacity. So now your computer can handle twice as much data. You double it again, now it can handle four times, et cetera. Right? There's a limit to vertical scaling, obviously. Computers only come so big. So what happens when you run out, you no longer can get a machine with more memory? You hit 128 gigs of RAM, and I don't think Amazon gives you a bigger machine than that. You buy another machine. You buy another machine. So I'm going to call that horizontal scaling. scaling had the nice advantage of we didn't really change how we used it, right? Redis, I just store more things in it. 
But horizontal scaling is a little more complicated. So now I got two machines. I have the data over here in one, it's called that A's data, and then the data over here, that's B's data. So I have the two machines, right? Now the only way that I actually get a scaling improvement here is by not storing the same data. So A has different data than B. If they have the same data, then I've just done nothing to help this problem, right? Mm -hmm. And so they have to have different data. So here's a question. How, how would I store, how would I do that? How would I store data in one and not the other for vice versa? I think we know how to do this. We've done hash. it in our own program. Hash it. Hash it. It's kind of like a hash table where you have different buckets. That's right. So how do we get A's bucket versus B's bucket? You write some awesome algorithm. <laughs> mod two. And you just say all the keys that are even go in A and all the ones that are odd go in B. And actually it's really simple. You don't need a sophisticated algorithm, right? You just, and oh, that's for two. Let's say you have ten machines. You just do mod ten. Okay? In other words, uh, if, you, if you get the hash, like you said, of your data, you get a big number. And if that number ends in zero, it goes in A. If that number ends in one, it goes in B. If that number ends in two, it goes in C. And so on, right? Now you can conceivably mod by any number. You could have 10,000 Redis machines and do it that way. Okay. So that's uh, partitioning. That's how you partition your data set. Uh, that's one way to partition. There's other ways too. But I just wanted to get you thinking that's how, uh, if you're in a, in a real web application uh, company, you have to sort of think about these things. Yeah? Okay, partitioning. I struggle with this concept when I, with my personally, just trying to figure out how to do it. And I myself off, but you're partitioning the data set. How is that different from partitioning your hard drive? Uh, when they say partition a hard drive. Yeah, yeah. You see, I was trying to optimize my saving, you know, I, and, and I never got around to doing it, but I've It's a, a similar idea. To, to partition, like you could partition this room. It just means to break a big thing up into smaller pieces. And that's all we're doing is we're breaking up a very large data set into smaller pieces. Okay? And so if you partition your hard drive, you're breaking up your hard drive into smaller pieces. It's the same idea. Right? Um, okay. It's just the reason we have to partition our data is because we can't fit it on one computer. Right. So we have to do something. Okay. Sure. Um, now Redis has a product called Redis Cluster, which does a lot of that for you. The other problem you have with this is, like I said, the what if something breaks? And so we typically, there's a lot of approaches to this, but one of those is called Master Slave, which is a great name for uh, <laughs> architecture. Right? And the idea is that um, I write to this guy, so I have my web server over here, and he's like writing, well, he's doing gets and sets, right? So he does get and set. Um, and then we have some process in place that detects if this is we just every once in a while try to connect to it. If we fail to connect to it, we say, kill the master, switch to the slave. Okay? And now he accesses the slave. The slave becomes a new master. We create a new machine, spin it up, and then it, and the idea is that the master is copying everything to the slave. Okay? So all the data it receives, it puts in the slave. Even though the slave's not being used, it's there in case the master breaks. So that's one approach to the redundancy. Yeah? So that, that actually solves the problem of uh, storing. But, uh, well, we're these two store, store identical copies of data. We're not talking about the first approach, like the partition. Uh, right, because if we lost A, we would lose all the data for A. So we would still have half of our data, but we would have lost the other half. We lost all the users who have their name started with A, for example. Well, we never want to lose their user information, so we also have to do this. And so what you'll see is in a Redis system, you might see a hybrid. I do partitioning, and then there's also a slave, and etc. B slave, and so on. Um, I just wanted to get you, like, this is how you have to think about these things. Yeah? I'm just thinking, like, in terms of, you know, if you're, if you're like, I don't know, and you have uh, millions of users, so you need, like, Millions, actually. Right? Um, so you're partitioning your your uh, data over all these computers. Right? 
Yeah. So would not make the retrieval of the, of the data a little bit more complicated? It is more complicated because now I have to write, instead of just get whatever the key is, I have to write, um, I have to know to go to A or I have to know to go to B to get it. And so you do have to add that logic to your program. Uh, there are products that make this easier. Redis does, now Redis cluster makes it a little easier, but the idea is that it's a library that handles those details for you and then you just, you use the old API, you use get and set delete, and it figures out where to get the gets. Um, but there are other databases like Cassandra and stuff that, that do a lot of this stuff for you. Uh, you had a question? Yeah, so like if you had um, like 10 Redis uh, horizontally scaled servers um, and like one uh, MySQL server or something, and the one server acts as a slave and the 10 other Redis ones act as a master. Is that like a valid way of doing things? Because with the MySQL thing, that's going to store memories. Or, uh, hard drive. Yeah. So a common pattern people use Redis for is in addition to SQL. And you use SQL as your, as your sort of uh, database of record. That's like the official real database. And then you store sort of cached versions. Every know what cache means? It's like a saved version of the data in Redis for quick access. And by doing that, I can sort of take a bunch of the load off of our main database, do most of it on the Redis, and then every once in a while, I'll hit the real server. Uh, so maybe those expire, and so it caches it for a minute. Uh, so you might get still data, but only a minute old data, and that's probably good enough for most applications, right? Uh, and so there's a lot of trade-offs there, and you have to think through them. Um, the other, can anybody think of an issue with this master slave? I'm, I'm a little bit lost. So the I get, I get the horizontal scale, you get multiple machines, I get it stored in memory, and that's all Redis. And then I also understand that, okay, you know, you could also have some sort of a database behind that, and that's like your main data storage, but you do everything in Redis like cache. But then you brought in the master slave thing, and what, what point were you trying to make there with the master slave? And you crossed out the master. If we lose A, we lose all the data for A. Yeah, right. So in order to, to make that safer, so we don't lose our data, we yeah. run two machines, and everything we do to A, we back up to the slave. So everything we do to the master, we're copying all that so data. So that's over just the mirroring. Slave. Yes. You're you're mirroring, and you do that in memory, or you do yes. that you do that from memory. So there is a connection from the master to the slave over yeah. the network, yeah. and it's sending all the data. Yeah. So every time you do a uh, set, it does the set over the slave. Okay. It has this huge log of every command that's ever been run. And it saves all that data. Okay. All right. So one downside with that is the timing. So there is a delay between me doing a set here and the set occurring in the slave. Just by definition, there has to be, right? Even if it's a microsecond, there's a delay because it happens here and then it goes over the network. It happens here. So what if the machine breaks when the set happened here, but before it made it over here? We lose that data. It's gone. Yeah, I was looking at it. <laughs> and so that's an issue, right? Uh, so all I want to do is tell you this is a huge issue in this area of uh, computer science. Um, and there's a theorem called CAP. So let's go look up CAP theorem that describes in great detail uh, the trade offs involved in this. Um, between availability and so the, the consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Consistency meaning all nodes see the same data at the same time. So it was possible in the system I just described to be inconsistent. Uh, but anyway, this is a huge area of like research and people are trying to make databases that meet all these requirements. Uh, this is one of these classic, you can have two, but not all three. That's what the theorem states. So pick any two, but you can't have all three. So is this where Firebase is starting to catch on because it, it hit some of these critical areas? Uh, maybe I, I'm not sure. Maybe Firebase says so. Let's look that up. Uh, Firebase uh, consistency. I don't know, you'd 
you'd have to look it up. But they'll, they usually will say uh, in, their, in their docs the, the behavior of the system when things like that happen. Um, so, Caleb, the essential issue you're saying with brewers there and here is that void of information that gets lost when the master goes down and the connection has one. The information hasn't been transferred to the slave, correct? Yeah, what I'm saying is the way you build this big distributed system of multiple computers, right. uh, there are trade-offs involved in what you do. So, for example, if we wanted to make it so that behaved properly, we can just make it so that uh, the set waits and doesn't tell the user that you set any data until we know it got to the slave. And once it got to the slave, then we tell the user it got set. Otherwise, it hasn't been set yet, and so... But there's trade-offs. If I do that now, it takes longer. Uh, most of the distributed systems, you don't do the simple, like, just master-slave. You do something way more complicated. Uh, so maybe one node is having the data for three nodes, and there's trade-offs there, too. Um, and I'm just saying that there, this is a huge open area, and when people talk about NoSQL databases, it enters you into this realm of thinking about all of those trade-offs. Yeah. And, and so, with our exercises up to this point, how have we been relating to Redis? Well, we just, we just made a fake Redis server. Which means what? Because I'm, I'm like looking at this website you pointed us to, and it says download it. What, when I download it, you know, purchase it, what have I downloaded that, I am, that I'm not doing already with what we've done? Oh, yet? well, it has a ton of other features. Okay, so uh, I figured there's features, but I'm not saying... And it doesn't cost anything, it's free. Right. So, no, no, I'm just saying, I, I just use this as a tangent, because now we can talk about... Yeah. We have databases and the way people think about them and stuff. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, so the, the point being that if you get into this realm, and these are the kind of problems you want to think about, uh, this is a very active area of research. This is something that companies like would like people to know. Uh, so there are jobs for people who know and understand all those things. So this is, if you're interested, that is something that's worth pursuing, is knowing about all this stuff, okay? Yeah. Um, so I imagine with, like, cap theorem, there would be, like, different philosophies on yeah. how to organize things. So is that kind of why someone might want to use in a, a Google Cloud Platform App Engine versus Container Engine? Oh, good point. So App Engine, I mean, we'll see it later. Uh, their data store describes in sort of technical, where is it? Um, the data store. I can never find it. Its behavior. Um, so high availability of reads and writes, strong consistency for reads, eventual consistency for all other queries. The eventual there means they're not guaranteeing the consistency of those operations. You might get stale data. Uh, so th they give you the details of the trade-offs involved in the, yeah, but in, anyway. I mean, it's, it's interesting to know about, but you don't have to really, it's not something we're gonna do now. <laughs> we're not making a NoSQL database. I just wanted you to be aware of, of that. Um, any, any questions about that whole area? I just think it's kinda interesting. Okay, so that's a bottomless pit. You could spend weeks trying to understand all these NoSQL databases, and uh, I will say that a lot of times there's like a brand new NoSQL database that's introduced, and they always say that they can do something, and then you discover later that it doesn't really work that way. Um, you know, we, we talk about the high availability, consistency, all that stuff. Computers do break. You should expect an Amazon computer to go down once a year, okay? If you don't build your system to account for that, you'll have downtime. Your website might be off the air for a day. Does that matter? I don't know, it depends on what your website is. If you're Twitter, that's a big deal, right? If you're the New York Stock Exchange, that's not acceptable, okay? Well, well Nokia, if their downtime that years ago killed them, from that moment on, they never seemed to have them back on their feet. But it, was it Nokia or was it uh, the smartphone they used to use before <laughs> Apple? Yeah. Blackberry. 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 But if you know, if you're Sally's pet grooming service, maybe a day of downtime is not that big of a deal, okay? Right. So. <laughs> not if Phoebe needs your haircut. <laughs> <laughs>